Okay, folks, let's get started. Happy 2014. Welcome back. Have we had a wild break? Who did the most exotic thing? I want everybody to be mad at somebody. Come on. Somebody besides me for a change. Who went very exotically over the break? Where'd you go? Australia. To where? Australia. Australia. All right. Where at in Australia? Awesome. Nice, nice tour. Anything more exotic than Australia? Nobody's going to admit? Yes. You did what? Fried? Fried buds. Oh, insects. Oh, she ate some fried insects. Now, you talk about exotic, tr exotic uh, experiences. Was that good? Where did you get these? I'll do it if you'll do it. Is that sort of thing? <laughs> Protein. What kind of bugs did you eat? Crickets? Tarantulas. Tarantulas. Interesting. Okay. That's more exotic than my, 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 my uh, time off was. I can eat crickets. I'm not sure I want to eat a tarantula. I don't know. That's even worse. <laughs> Good. Did it taste like a crab? Fishy. Ugh. Okay. Well, we're back for another term. So for those of you who weren't in my 450 class last term and are here this term, uh, my name is Kevin Ahern. And... Um, this is our class webpage. Copy that URL down because that's where you're going to do most of your uh, interacting. Um, the syllabus in the class is required reading, and you can download it right there. So I don't hand out paper copies because there's a lot of people in the class. I don't like to waste any more paper than necessary. Um, I like to run the class in sort of an unusual fashion, which I think many of you have seen. And I thought we would maybe start it off with an unusual fashion instead of finishing with an unusual fashion. So. Um, I thought we'd start off with a song instead of uh, having a song at the end of the period. So uh, this is a good song to start the term off on, and I hope that you will enjoy it and you'll sing along. It's to an old tune. The old tune is called Everything is Beautiful, and this tune is called Biochem is Beautiful. If I can get it to go. <laughs> Proteins, fat, and DNAs, there must be a million ways to evaluate our knowledge for the test. It's beautiful, our professor says, from the sugar in our cells to actions of HDL. Molecules are dutiful in every way. Substrates for the enzymes are converted everything. There's no inside lower delta G. They just work all the time on transition energy. Consists rise to cells, but the public jump started. They all capitalize by giving rise reaction. 
kind of a sentiment we can all feel here, right? So, okay, all right. Cut that off. So uh, the deal that this term is the same as last term. You sing loud for the songs, and we'll have extra credit on the exams. So that's the way it works, right? Okay. Well, uh, we've got an exciting term. Um, this term, the first half, it's an unusual term. I'll, I'll tell you that first off. Uh, the first half of the term, we deal with metabolism. And I know from interacting with many of you at the end of the term, last term, that you began to see how metabolism is really interesting and how metabolism really helps you to understand why your body does what it does and how it works. And I can promise you, I can absolutely promise you that you're going to see a lot more of that this term. You're going to understand why we have something called regulatory control, how regulatory control really explains an awful lot more than we had even last term to talk about. So I think that's something that's really exciting about metabolism that I like to try to convey uh, to students. So let's dive into it. Um, we start with the citric acid cycle. And the citric acid cycle turns out to be a uh, really critical um, uh, pathway. Uh, it's critical in the sense that every uh, single cell on the face of the earth essentially has all of it or some of it. Okay? There's virtually not a cell anywhere that doesn't have almost every part of it. And probably 99.99% .99 of cells have every bit of it. Okay? So this tells us that this is a really, really important cycle. Right? It is the first cycle that you're going to see that is circular. Okay? There's only a couple of them that actually exist in cells that are circular. This is one of them. Okay? If we look at it schematically, what we see is that, well, there's a circle. That's what it looks like. Okay? A circular pathway doesn't really have a start point and an end point, but we will talk about one place as being a start point. Okay? You can sort of see it here. The entry of acetyl-CoA, which we'll talk about in some depth, the entry of acetyl-CoA into the cycle is what we will really talk about being the start point for this citric acid cycle. Okay? What we see in this cycle that acetyl-CoA comes in, we sort of remember or know something about acetyl-CoA from last term, and that is that acetyl-CoA has two carbons that are important. Right? The acetate part, the acetyl part. All right. So we have a cycle that two carbons come in on. And as the cycle turns, we see that two carbon dioxides are produced. That tells us two carbons in, two carbons out. It tells us that, it tells us that there's no net gain in carbons in this cycle. Okay. We notice that there are eight electrons that come off. And you remember from oxidation that I talked about last term that electrons don't come off freely inside of cells, but instead they're passed to electron carriers. And you may remember that I said that electrons are passed off in pairs. So that means that this cycle produces four reduced electron carriers. Four reduced electron carriers. If that wasn't enough, the cycle also produces GTP. Okay? GTP, you recall, has the same energy component as ATP does. And so this is a cycle that is very important from an energetic perspective. This cycle produces a lot more energy than glycolysis. It's one of the reasons it is so central to cells. If cells can't run this cycle when they need to, they're hosed. Okay? I'll briefly mention when I talk about the cycle, probably on Wednesday, but wherever we see inhibitors of the cycle, we kill cells. Okay? If we inhibit this cycle, we're going to kill cells. Now, that doesn't mean the cycle runs all the time. But when cells need it, if they don't have this cycle, they're in trouble. So, um, let's see, what else can I tell you? This cycle is also important from another perspective in that many of the intermediates in the cycle are intermediates in other pathways. They're intermediates in other pathways. Okay? This cycle is what we call anaplerotic. That's spelled A-N-A, -A, 
P-L-E-R-O-T-I-C. Anapleurotic literally means to fill up. So there are some components of the cycle that if the cell needs them for other things, it will take them. And it's also a dumping ground because when cells are done with certain things, they will release them and be used in the cycle. Very common things we see affecting the cycle are amino acids. Amino acids can be made from intermediates in the cycle, and amino acids can donate things to the cycle. Is, I shouldn't say amino acids, but amino acid metabolism can donate those things to the cycle. Okay? So this cycle is really, really critical for cells. There are eight steps in the cycle. It's shorter than glycolysis. Glycolysis has 10 steps. Okay? And this shows the cycle in a little bit more depth. We don't see intermediates yet, but you can now see some of the uh, things being produced and where they're being produced. There's two carbons coming in. The two carbons join with four carbons to make a six carbon intermediate. That six carbon intermediate gets oxidized to a five carbon intermediate, producing a carbon dioxide and also producing an NADH. There's the first electron carrier. This five carbon intermediate gets oxidized to a four carbon intermediate that produces another carbon dioxide and another NADH. The four carbon intermediate can be converted into something else producing a GTP and that something else is not shown, but that something else can be oxidized to produce an FADH2. The something else of that can be oxidized to produce NADH. And we're back where we started with that four carbon intermediate. Now I'm going to show you those reactions, but I'm just giving you an overview right now of what's happening inside of this cycle. Okay? All right. So very, very important. Now, we saw two carbons coming in. The two carbons come in from acetyl-CoA. And where do we get acetyl-CoA from in the cell? Well, I hope from last term you remember, if anybody even remembers last term, that we get it from pyruvate. We can actually get acetyl-CoA from many sources. The only one you've seen so far is pyruvate. How many pyruvates do we have per glucose? Two. So that means that we produce two acetyl-CoAs. So for every glucose, we double this. So for every glucose that, that sends its carbons through the citric acid cycle in the form of acetyl-CoA, for every glucose we started with, we produce six NADHs and two, NADH, uh, two FADH2s and two GTPs. That was a heck of a lot more than we got out of glycolysis. In glycolysis, we got two ATPs, we got two NADHs. And that was it. Okay. So the citric acid cycle is a very, very important uh, cycle for respiration, for energy. Okay? This figure aims to give you more of an overview of the importance of the cycle in the life of the cell. Okay? Here's acetyl-CoA. And as you can see from all these things on the left, acetyl-CoA can be produced by many things. Okay? The metabolism of fatty acids one of the byproducts, in fact, the byproduct of fatty acid metabolism is acetyl-CoA. The byproduct of aerobic oxidation of glucose is acetyl-CoA. The oxidation and metabolism of many amino acids yields acetyl-CoA. And also, amino acids, we see some, some of the amino acids produce intermediates in the cycle as well. Okay? So this cycle is really intimately involved in everything that's going on inside of the cell. We see one substrate level phosphorylation. You may remember that substrate level phosphorylation is where we directly make a triphosphate from a high energy intermediate. One substrate level phosphorylation. Most of the triphosphates that are made are not made by substrate level phosphorylation. They're made separately in a process we call oxidative phosphorylation. And oxidative phosphorylation occurs inside of the mitochondrion. Guess what? Conveniently, the citric acid cycle also occurs inside of the mitochondrion. Okay? 
The mitochondrion you've heard described in your cell biology classes as the energy power plant of the cell. And you're going to see this term, why we say that. Probably 99% of your ATP comes from oxidative phosphorylation inside of the mitochondrion. Okay, um, the mitochondrion is an important organelle within our cells. This is an electron micrograph showing the cross-section of a mitochondrion. We'll talk more about the anatomy of the mitochondrion later, but I just want to show you uh, what it looks like so you get an idea about what we're talking about. Our cells have variable numbers of mitochondria depending upon the energy uh, needs of a cell. A muscle cell will have, for example, a lot more mitochondria than will a skin cell because a muscle cell is doing work. Okay? The real uh, important part of the mitochondrion that we'll talk about this term is what's called the inner mitochondrial membrane. The inner mitochondrial membrane is loaded with important proteins, some of which are enzymes, not all of which are, some of which are enzymes. Okay? And these proteins in the mitochondrial inner membrane are what make possible this production of ATP that I've talked about. There's a schematic of the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion has an outer membrane that looks like that. The outer membrane is kind of dull. We don't talk about it much. The inner mitochondrial membrane is where all the action is. And you can see the inner mitochondrial membrane has infoldings that look like this. Okay? If we look back at that last figure at those infoldings, they actually look a little bit different. These are the infoldings. You can see them. They're infoldings, infoldings, etc. Okay? So infoldings of the mitochondrial membrane provide a lot more surface area for the mitochondrial membrane. That turns out to be really critical, again, for the function of it. Okay, well, I've been building up to the citric acid cycle, but there's an important bridge I haven't crossed. And the bridge that I have not crossed is getting from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. I've said that we get acetyl-CoA from pyruvate, but I haven't talked about how we get it. Last term, I briefly mentioned pyruvate metabolism. Now we're going to talk about pyruvate metabolism up close and personal. Okay? To go from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we have to oxidize pyruvate. Okay? That's an oxidation reaction. It's also a decarboxylation reaction. We're going from the three-carbon compound to a two-carbon compound, the two-carbon compound being attached to coenzyme A. Okay? That decarboxylation is an oxidation, although we will see there are ways to do it without an oxidation, but for most part it's an oxidation, and that oxidation generates electrons. That means it's going to generate reduced electron carriers, or a reduced electron carrier, and in this case the reduced electron carrier is NADH. So now we're seeing production of even more reduced electron carriers. Okay? If we have two, uh, one glucose, we have two pyruvates, we have two carbon dioxides, we have four electrons, and we have two reduced NADHs. And most importantly for our purposes, we have an acetyl-CoA. Well, let's look and understand, hopefully, how it is that that acetyl-CoA is produced. That's what the, oh, by the way, I'll show you this because this shows you when I say the two carbons, there's the two carbons we're interested in, and here's what it's attached to. That's coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is a mondo molecule that serves, I like to think about CoA as serving as a sort of a handle that the cell can grab onto a known thing and then use the thing that's at the end of the handle. That's really how the coenzyme A uh, functions in the cell. Okay, well, when we talk about oxidation of pyruvate, there are actually two different names that people give to the enzyme that uh, catalyzes that reaction. And they're not consistent in their use of names. So I'm going to try to be consistent, and hopefully you'll be consistent with my designation in talking about it. Okay? The two names that you hear is you hear the one that's right here, pyruvate dehydrogenase 
And pyruvate dehydrogenase is a complex. We'll see it's a complex of three different subunits, each of which has a function inside of the, uh, the cell. Inside the, this is actually located, by the way, in the mitochondrion. Okay? It has three different uh, components that are there. Okay? The other name we hear associated with this is some people call it pyruvate decarboxylase. And your book uses both terms. Stryer uses both terms, and they don't use the terms consistently. Now, how is my consistency different? Okay. Well, first of all, why are they both terms? All right. Well, pyruvate decarboxylase does tell us what the enzyme does. It's decarboxylating pyruvate. All right. It turns out that pyruvate decarboxylase is a function of one of the subunits of the complex. So if we think of the complex, it includes three components, one of which is an activity we call pyruvate decarboxylase. Does that make sense? So when I say pyruvate dehydrogenase, I'm talking about the complex. And when I say pyruvate, decarbo pyruvate dehydrogenase, I'm talking about the complex. When I say pyruvate decarboxylase, I'm talking about one of the subunits. Make sense? I will usually talk about pyruvate dehydrogenase. We'll talk about the complex. But for a few minutes, I'm going to talk about the individual components of the complex because understanding how they perform their functions allows us to understand better how pyruvate gets decarboxylated and also how one of the reactions of the citric acid cycle works because it uses an enzyme that's very, very similar to pyruvate dehydrogenase. Let's look at the complex. Here's the complex. That doesn't show us too much. It looks sort of like dice or something sitting there, doesn't it? Okay. Well, schematically, what that guy looks like is, oh, sorry. Schematically, what that guy looks like is more like this. Okay. We see that it has three subunits, and we're, and we're going to give them very simple names. We're going to give them a name of E1, E2, and E3. Okay? You see them here, E1, E2, and E3. They're color coded on this scheme. E1 is what we will call the pyruvate decarboxylase because that's what it does. E1 catalyzes the decarboxylation of the pyruvate. Well, you say, well, you've done the decarboxylation. Isn't that all there is to it? No, there's not, as we will see in the mechanism. There's a lot more to what's going on. So the decarboxylation turns out to be the very first step in this process. And that's done by E1. OK. Well, here are the components. And here's some big mouthful of names. If you want to memorize mouthful of names, you can get them right here. Notice that your book here is calling it pyruvate dehydrogenase component, okay, when in fact it's actually pyruvate decarboxylase. Pyruvate decarboxylase is E1. Okay. You see this is a pretty big complex. Look at the number of chains of this in that complex. Look at the number of chains of this in the complex. Look at the number of chains there. There's 60 chains in this complex. Okay. E1, which is the decarboxylase, has a couple of functions. One of them is decarboxylating pyruvate. Okay? So let's take a look at the reaction. Actually, yeah, okay, I'll come back. I'll come back to that. Okay. So here's what's happening in going from pyruvate over to acetyl CoA. All right? The first step is the decarboxylation. All right. The second step is the oxidation. Now notice that decarboxylation is not happening at the same time as the oxidation is. They're happening in separate reactions. The E1 is managing both this and it's managing part of the oxidation. The oxidation is happening between E1 and E2 as we'll see where the enzyme is passing this intermediate off. 
Now, those of you who have very good memories and remember things from last term, first of all, you're probably better off than I am, but remember that yeast had the ability to take pyruvate and make what in, under anaerobic conditions? Alcohol. Everybody remembers that one, right? That's an easy one, right? It make alcohol out of it, all right? If they go through the oxidation step, they can't make alcohol. But what yeast and bacteria have is the ability to avoid the oxidation step and, a, and convert this instead into ethanol. Okay? We don't have the ability to do that. Once we have made, once we have done the decarboxylation, we will do the oxidation. We cannot switch off and make ethanol. Bacteria and yeast can do that. Okay? So it's possible for them to decarboxylate but not oxidize. We don't have that option. Okay? After the oxidation happens, then this molecule, which is actually fairly reactive, is passed off to coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA. Okay? This happens in complex 2. So we have complex 1, E1, we have complex E1 slash E2, and we have complex E2. Okay? Where does E3 fit in? Well, we've got these electrons we've got to account for. There is where E3 is involved. E3 handles the electrons and regenerates the original enzyme. Okay, so I'm going a little fast. I'm going to slow down, ask if you have any questions about what I've talked about so far. Yes? So, is there what tells the yeast or bacteria to not oxidize? Anybody remember from last term? Whether oxygen is available, right? If oxygen is available, what do we have? Aerobic, but what molecule do we have if we have oxygen available? Nobody remembers this, do they? Pop quiz. What, what? NAD, exactly. Why are cells going through fermentation? They're going through fermentation to make NAD because they've run out. When there's plenty of oxygen, you have plenty of NAD. So the determination for bacteria and yeast is, do I have NAD? That's what it comes down to. If they don't have NAD, they will instead go through fermentation, just like your muscle cells will go through fermentation if your blood supply isn't delivering su oxygen sufficiently fast. Okay? Yes? Why do we talk about the citric acid cycle as being started by acetyl-CoA? Okay, his question is, why do we talk about the citric acid cycle being uh, started with acetyl-CoA? Could it be pushed by something else? The answer is, yes, it can to some extent. Exaloacetate is not a good thing to start it with because to go to that next step requires an acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA, well, you'll see the cycle when I get to that. But other things, yes, and his question is a very good one in the sense that let's say that I am a cell, let's say I'm on a real low-fat diet. I'm not low-fat, a low-fat diet, a low-carb diet. And the primary food that I'm eating is, is protein. I can still get plenty of energy from that protein because I can convert amino acids like um, glutamic acid into a citric acid cycle intermediate and push the cycle. So your question is very good, it's very appropriate, and yes, you can do that. So there are ways of using this cycle to do some very cool things. Yes, sir? Uh, so the E2, that's where it's actually transferred, like the acetylase is transferred to the coenzyme A attached to it, and then the acetyl-CoA is transferred. That's correct. So, the, so his question was, the uh, uh, E2 is where the transfer to acetyl-CoA, where, where the CoA is transferred to that group, and the answer is yes, it is. Yes? And you said E1 was also part of the oxidation. E1 is part of the oxidation as well. So let me show you another. I'm jumping around a little bit on my figures, but let me show you a schematic that shows us a little better. Then I'll come back and I'll talk about the individual reactions. So the overall uh, reaction schematic is here. Maybe it's a good place to actually talk about it. All right? This schematically shows E1, E2, and E3. Okay? Now, 
This enzyme is complicated in terms of having many subunits. It's also complicated in having many coenzymes. Coenzymes are non-amino acids that help an enzyme to do something. Non-amino acids that help an enzyme to do something. It turns out there are five coenzymes that the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex requires. Five coenzymes. I'm going to list them for you, and then I'm going to show you their function as we go through. The first is called thiamine pyrophosphate. It's called TPP. It sounds like the, like the vitamin thiamine, and it's exactly the enzyme thiamine. Okay. It requires an intermediate called lipoic acid, or lipoamide, as we will talk about it. We'll, we'll use those terms interchangeably. L-I-P-O-I-C-A-C-I-D for lipoic acid. It requires coenzyme A, because we're passing the acetyl group onto a CoA. There's the third thing it requires. The fourth thing it requires is FAD. That's an electron carrier. And interestingly, this enzyme also requires a second electron carrier, NAD. And NAD is the ultimate destination for the electrons produced in this oxidation. So five coenzymes. Now I'm going to talk about the functions of these coenzymes as we look through the cycle. Okay? All right, step number one. Pyruvate gets decarboxylated. We saw that in the, the reaction I showed you earlier. That produces what some people call um, an, a, um, an activated uh, acid aldehyde. It's a big mouthful of a name. You don't need to know that. But what it's producing is a two-carbon molecule that is an intermediate that is very reactive. To keep that, re that intermediate from reacting with something, it gets attached to thiamine pyrophosphate. That's located in E1. So the decarboxylation is happening in E1, and we see the transfer of that two-carbon intermediate to thiamine pyrophosphate. Okay. In the next step of the process, which is an oxidation, this two-carbon intermediate, and by the way, if we're a bacterium and we don't have oxygen, this is where it's going to branch off. It's not going to go to this step. Okay. But in our cells, it's always going to go to this step. It goes to this step, and in this step, the two-carbon intermediate is passed off to lipoamide. Lipoamide is right there. Lipoamide, you see, has a carbon, di I'm sorry, a, a, a disulfide bond, not a carbon, but a disulfide bond in it. That is an oxidized form of sulfur. If I take an oxidized form of sulfur and I add electrons to it, what do I produce? I produce a reduced form of sulfur, a sulfhydryl, right? Okay. But if something has given me electrons, that something that's given me electrons is becoming oxidized. That's what's happening here. So we go from here where we see a two-carbon intermediate with a hydroxyl. Down here we see it's been passed to the lipoamide, it gets attached to the lipoamide, and now it's an acetyl group. Single bond oxygen, double bond oxygen. Okay? It's actually in this step that the oxidation is occurring. And I said it was between E1 and E2. There's the oxidation, starting off in E1, ending up in E2. Everybody with me? So the oxidation has happened at this point. But you notice the electron carriers aren't even involved yet. Why? Because the electrons got passed to the lipoamide. Lipoamide is what's holding on to the electrons right now. So the very first electron carrier in this process is lipoamide. The very first electron carrier is lipoamide. Now we're in E2, and we see in E2 that a coenzyme A comes in and grabs that acetyl group, and that produces acetyl-CoA. And what we're left with behind is this reduced 
sulfhydryl compound. Okay? This reduced sulfhydryl compound we see now is kind of sticking its nose into E3, and that turns out to be important because it's in E3 where FAD is located. The electrons that are sitting here in this guy pass themselves off to FAD to make FADH2. And when that happens, the sulfhydryl goes back to being a disulfide. I promise this whole term isn't going to be mechanism. Okay. I show you this mechanism because, as I said, it's interesting. And it also teaches you something about a mechanism that happens later in the citric acid cycle. The last step of the process involves the transfer of electrons from, from FAD, I'm sorry, from FADH2 to NAD to make NADH. And there is what is finally released. That reproduces the FAD, and we're right back where we started. The cycle has turned once. We've produced an acetyl CoA, and we've produced an NADH. And those are the products of the cycle. Now, this passing of electrons from FADH2 to NAD doesn't typically happen. It doesn't happen elsewhere in the cell. In fact, energetically, if I try to get FADH2 to pass electrons onto NAD, it's not very energetically favorable. Why is it energetically favorable here? This has an unusual electronic environment set up within this complex that makes that transfer possible. So we won't, for the rest of the term, talk about moving electrons from FADH2 to NAD because elsewhere in the cell we can't do that. Only here. Yes? Does it produce two NADHs? Does it produce two NADHs? It produces one. Remember, each pair of electrons is it takes a pair of electrons to make one NADH. Now, if, we had, if we're counting from glucose, yes, because we have two pyruvates and we have two of each of these. But for this one cycle, we only have one NADH. So when you say here, where do you mean exactly in the cell? This is happening inside the mitochondria. OK? Yes, sir? Is this a process that's particularly tightly controlled or regulated? Is this a process that's tightly controlled or regulated? Another very good question, OK? So regulation turns out to be very simple. This is, you're you're going to like this. Okay? Regulation turns out to be very, very simple for this. It is. The regulation of the citric acid, in fact, the entire citric acid cycle, we'll see some allosteric effectors. But for the most part, the things that regulate this reaction and that regulate the entire citric acid cycle are basically the, elect, the availability of electron carriers. If we have enough NAD, this reaction will go. And if we don't have enough NAD, this reaction will not go. That turns out to be at the heart of what I call metabolic control. We'll talk a lot about metabolic control and understand, again, how it is our body is responding to its environment. OK, good questions. Other questions? Yeah. Is there a hydrogen that disappears in step three? In going from here down to here, uh, there, is a, uh, there are uh, protons produced as a result of that. Yes. Into the matrix, the mitochondrion, just in the mitochondrion. Yep. That's the same thing that happens in six. Right. Yep. Yep. All right. Everybody's ready? OK. So uh, that's the basic mechanism of this overall process. Let me show you the intermediates I just described to you. Again, you don't need to know the structures, but I'm just showing you so you're familiar with them. You'll see them. There's thiamine pyrophosphate. As I said, that's related to the vitamin thiamine. That's why we need to have thiamine in our diet. There's lipoic acid. Lipoic acid turns out to be a really interesting compound when we get thinking about longevity. We get thinking about longevity, this compound turns out to be really interesting. I won't go into it here, but Dr. Tori Hagen in the Linus Pauling Institute does uh, really interesting research on lipoic acid. And lipoic acid, in many cases, relate to healthy mitochondria. Mitochondria that don't look like they've been damaged 
by oxidation. We're going to see oxidation, a lot of oxidation going on inside of mitochondria. And a lot of oxidation in mitochondria damages the mitochondrion. Old mitochondria, for example, when you look at them in a cell, are really beat up. And they're beat up because all the oxidation that's occurring in them, if only a small percentage cross-reacts, it damages the mitochondria. And that's what happens to mitochondria over a long period of time. Lipoic acid excuse me, may play a role in helping to prevent some of that damage. OK. Um, nah. Nah. OK. So that is uh, the basics of what um, I want you to understand in terms of the oxidation of pyruvate. We have about seven minutes left, so what I'd like to do is spend some time now starting on the citric acid cycle and talking to you about that. We're not going to approach the citric acid cycle from a mechanistic point of view. <coughs> we are going to approach it from an understanding of the reactions and an understanding of the regulation. Because as I said, the very simple regulation tells us a world of things about our cells. Okay? So here's what we typically talk about is the first step of the citric acid cycle. But again, remembering we're working in a cycle. The very first step that we think about the cycle occurring with, and the reason we think about the first is this is the input of new material. This is, the, this is where the new stuff comes in. The new stuff coming in is acetyl-CoA. It's providing two carbons. And those two carbons are joined to a four-carbon molecule, oxaloacetate. You saw oxaloacetate. Last term, where did you see it? Anybody remember? Gluconeogenesis. And where did I say the first reaction of gluconeogenesis occurred? In the mitochondrion. And guess where we are? In the mitochondrion. Oh, that's really interesting. Coincidence? I think not. OK. Exaloacetate is a four carbon molecule. We see exaloacetate in a lot of things, a lot of places. Exaloacetate is in the citric acid cycle. Exaloacetate is an intermediate in some amino acid metabolism. One can readily make aspartic acid from exaloacetate. Exaloacetate is a very, very important uh, compound. Two carbons plus four carbons gives us six carbons. Am I going to require you to memorize the structures of the citric acid cycle? What do you think? <laughs> what was that? He says, I'll probably have you remember the names and not the structures. OK, should we take a vote? OK, how many want to remember the structures? It's hard to get unanimity in a class, but I think I've got unanimity. OK, so you're not going to memorize the structures. You will need to know the names. Very good. You will need to know the names of the enzymes. Yes, know the names of the enzymes. And you will need to know the number of carbons. Because that tells you where the decarboxylation is happening. OK. Now, if I were to make you memorize the structures, I could show you in five minutes how to memorize them, but I'm not going to do that. OK? It's actually very easy to do, very, very simple to do. However, if you're curious, come see me. I'll show them to you. All right, here's a reaction that's catalyzed by an enzyme called citrate synthase, S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. Again, the name of the enzyme tells it what it does. Synthase, making something. Citrate, synthase, makes citrate. This reaction okay, that you see right here is very energetically favorable. There's something I said last term, if anybody remembers it, that should be able to tell you why this reaction is energetically favorable. Does anybody remember what that is? Activated intermediate. There's two points extra credit right there. OK? Activated intermediate. Yes, I do give extra credit by, the, by virtue of pointing at somebody and getting answers to that. OK? Two points extra credit. Yeah. Activated intermediates are molecules that have a large amount of energy. They have a high energy bond. And they use some of the energy of that bond to donate a part of itself to something else. Here's. An activated intermediate has a high energy bond that's right there. It's right there. It's using the energy of that bond to donate a part of itself to something else to make this. 
This high energy bond makes this reaction very energetically favorable. Okay? Okay. Now, that turns out to be really important because when we go around the whole cycle, the last reaction is very energetically unfavorable. We'll see these two work together to play nice very, very well. If I have an energetically favorable reaction, when I'm at equilibrium and I start with equal amounts of reactants and products, what do I have the most of at the end of it? Products, by a long ways, which means I am losing substrate, reactants, right? And if this reactant here is the product of another reaction, what does it do to that other reaction? It pulls it, right? Pulling a reaction is exactly why this energetic, energetic consideration here is very important. Okay. Second reaction. I promise this will be the last one of the day. The second reaction is really an isomerization. We're just simply moving a hydroxyl group from, from this middle carbon to a carbon closer to the end, going from here up to here. This reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme who's the only one that doesn't have a name that, that tells you what it does in the cycle. It's called a conotase. And that's because the, the, the transient intermediate is called a conotate. We won't worry about the transient intermediate. Citrate goes to isocitrate. Okay? Now, this aconitase enzyme turns out to be really, really important. And the reason it's very important is because this enzyme is very strongly inhibited by a compound known as fluorocitrate. If I have something called fluorocitrate, I've got a fluorine up here attached to this guy, and it doesn't, this enzyme is dead in the water. Why is that important? Well, it was important back in the 1960s when there were ranchers out west who decided it's time to get rid of coyotes. And the best way to get rid of coyotes is to poison them. And the best way to poison the coyotes is to flee feed them fluoroacetate. Very poisonous. Well, the reason it was very poisonous was fluoroacetate is handled by citrate synthase just fine it makes fluorocitrate, and fluorocitrate killed this enzyme. It killed coyotes really, really well because it stopped their aconitase enzyme, it stopped their citric acid cycle in its tracks. Unfortunately, the vultures that ate the coyotes were also very susceptible. And birds that fed on anything, any of the, the predator birds that fed on this all got poisoned. Fluoro Citra, uh, fluoroacetate has been banned as a result of this. Okay, let's talk on.